Evangelization, in one sense, is the fine art of paying attention to what's going on around you and what people are and what's happening in their lives. I would say another way we could talk about reaching out to inactive Catholics is we need to become aware of our call to mirror, like we become mirrors to them of who they are and where they are going and what God is doing in their lives. And uh, in the same way that a mirror we look at it, we might be very happy about how the mirror looks, or we might look at it and see, uh, oh, there's less hair, more hair, too much hair, too little hair, too many creases, what all the things that might happen in our lives. This is what listening is really about. Uh, it's about mirroring back to a person, not only what they're saying, but how they feel about it, what you pick up in terms of the, the indications from them when they speak. And we asked that question, who really listened to you when you were growing up? And were there any special qualities to that listening? I think probably one of the strongest mirrors in my life, uh, and eventually she became a spiritual director, was Sister Robert, Sister Mary Robert. Sister Mary Robert in our parish, when I was a very confused teenager, listened to me. And um, I graduated from high school. She was one of my teachers. And she decided that uh, she would put some time in to just really allow me to say what I felt like in my life. Well, just prior to getting to talk to her one to one, I had had a very, uh, you might think, silly experience, but it was a very traumatic experience for me. I was playing cards with a group of my friends, and people were talking about uh, when their parents got married. And one of my friends, Joe, when I said when my parents were married, he knew when my birthday was, and he go he started counting on his fingers. And he said, "Wait a minute, you're a bastard." And from then on, the nickname in the group of friends that I had was I was the bastard. And it it hit me like a sledgehammer. I felt so stupid that I hadn't realized that my parents had me, that the, the pregnancy took place before they got married. And it, it hurt me. And I, I really didn't feel I could ever talk about that with my parents. But I was able to let all that out in speaking to Sister Barbara, uh, Sister Robert. And one of the things that really helped me was when she just said to me after I got finished talking and talking and talking, she said, you know, John, you have a lot of problems. And I said, yeah. And she said to me, I have no idea what to do to help you. But I believe that Jesus wants to help you. And we stopped and we prayed and asked Jesus to help me in my life. And at the time, I didn't have any real consciousness of Jesus. I wasn't, wasn't clear as to if he was anything or anybody. But then she said after that, if you ever hear when you're in college of a, of a weekend retreat called Antioch, you should go to it. You should really go to it. That's all she said. Well, what it realized to me, or it helped me to realize, was that we, as believers in Jesus, through our baptism, confirmation, and Eucharist, become mirrors to others of how much God loves them. And the first thing God does is listen to us. He doesn't get bent up out of shape about anything that we say or how we say it. Now, many years later, did Pope Francis, in his document on the joy of the gospel, finally say what this is. It's called the art of accompaniment. And he wrote about it this way in section 169. The church will have to initiate everyone, priests, religious, and laity, into this art of accompaniment, which teaches us to remove our sandals before the sacred ground of the other person. He's referring, of course, to Moses taking his sandals off before the burning bush in Exodus. The pace of this accompaniment must be steady and reassuring, reflecting our closeness and our compassionate gaze 
which also heals, liberates, and encourages growth in the Christian life. Basically what this says to us is that people are primarily evangelized or brought closer to Jesus Christ by other believers, by disciples of Jesus, and not primarily by programs or projects. Now, programs and projects are very good, but unless there are people who believe in Jesus that are running the program and are helping each other and reflecting back to each other this love of God, the programs have little effect over time. Secondly, it says to us that we, we need to be, and are called to, place others first and learn how to love them, even the ones we can't stand. Is there anyone out there who has some people in their life that they can't stand? Just raise your hand. Does anybody know themselves that they're somebody that somebody else can't stand? Raise your hand. Because we all have those experiences. And I think it's important for us to realize that we are called, even with those people, no matter how bad the situation is, to love them with the love of Jesus. Philippians chapter 2 says this, if there is any encouragement in Christ, any solace in love, any participation in the Spirit, any compassion and mercy, complete my joy by being of the same mind with the same love, united in heart, thinking only one thing. Do nothing out of selfishness or out of vain glory. Rather, humbly regard others as more important than yourselves, each looking out not for their own interests, but also everyone for the interests of others. What we're being called thirdly is, is to put on, really put on the attitude of Jesus Christ. In Philippians, it says this in a very succinct way in, cha in chapter 2 verses 5 to 7. Have among yourselves the same attitude that is also yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God something to be grasped. Rather, he emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, coming in human likeness, and found human in appearance, he humbled himself, becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Listening in this accompanying way to others is like a little death for us, isn't it? That we don't get the chance, we're not supposed to be preparing to talk back and give our view of things and give somebody our advice but first of all to hear to listen and to respond not only to what we're hearing but to what God might be saying to this person this is the story of the Samaritan women that we read as our prayer today John 4 4 to 42 talks about how Jesus listens to this woman and they go back and forth in a conversation he doesn't immediately hit her in the head and say, you are a rotten person, you are an unbeliever, you suck. He doesn't say that to her. He listens to her and hears what she is looking for. She's looking for something more. And he describes to her how she can have the living water. Those are the words that really struck me from that passage. That he tells her about, you could have living water that will stay with you forever. And that's what she responds to, that hope, that joy. And we can bring and be that kind of hope and joy to others when we just really get out of the way. I mean, I remember one story of Mother Teresa, St. Teresa of, of Calcutta, where a cardinal pulled her aside and said, what can I do to love people the way I should? And she told him, get out of God's way. And when we really listen, we're trying to get out of our own way so that God can be able to speak to the person and through the person. Effective evangelizing of others calls for effective evangelizing communication. We need a church capable of walking at people's sides, of doing more than simply listening to them. A church that accompanies them on their journey a church able to make sense of the night contained in the flight of so many of our brothers and sisters from Jerusalem, from the church, 
that realizes that the reasons why people leave also contain reasons why they can eventually return. It's often just hearing and accepting a person and saying, what's going on? What's kept you away? What's your story? Tell me your story about why you're not a Catholic. You ever have those situations, you're talking to somebody you met in the street or even a friend or a relative, and they say, I used to be Catholic. I used to go to church, but I don't do that anymore. Well, what happened to you? That's the first words that we can offer them hope. That somebody hears what's going on and what pain and understanding what's going back behind it. In On the Joy of the Gospel, the Pope also says, genuine spiritual accompaniment always begins and flourishes in the context of service in the mission of evangelization. That we serve another by listening. That we serve another in ways that they feel that we have served. That they hear us. That they, they experience the touch of God through us. Now, I didn't always know this about evangelizing others or sharing faith with others. The first book I ever read on evangelization was called Soul Winning Made Easy. It was written by a brother Protestant. I won't tell you who it was or anything. There were no books on Catholic evangelization available when I got started. They only started after that to be written, after 1975-1976. And in this book, here was the way that he trapped somebody into following Jesus. He would walk up to them, he would step on their foot, and he would poke them in the shoulder and say, you need to make Jesus Christ the center of your life, and you need to fall down and give yourself to Jesus, and that's all it is. Until they did that, he and would. You gotta get away from me. <laughs> oh, yeah. He would not. He would not let them go. He stepped on their foot so they couldn't get away. And I said to myself, "Oh my God, I don't think that's a Catholic way of doing this thing. We're a little more subtle than that. We've got to have Catholic ways of doing this." So I started to look for how do you understand. How your nonverbals, how you how you I can identify with another person, and how you can express empathy toward them. Our nonverbal communication, a lot of times, and maybe you even heard this phrase, someone will say, What you are doing is so loud I can't hear what you're saying. Communication in all the, the studies that I've seen can be as much by 55% of communication by facial expression, 38% by the tone of the voice, and only 7% by what words are being spoken. Let me give you an example. I was in St. Diphtheria's parish one time, and the lector got up to, to welcome everybody at the beginning and, and said this, Good morning. Welcome to St. Diphtheria's parish. We are so glad that you are here today. And I said, uh-oh, this is going to be quite an experience. And checked out mentally, pretty much. What can we do instead? Well, first of all, we need to be present to another person, to turn toward them. Even physically be present, rather than turning away. When we speak to somebody, if they're not, we're not looking at them, and we're speaking to them and they're not looking at us it's like you're speaking to a wall ask God to give you peace about what's going on because many times we're anxious and and that usually comes out of the fact that we're thinking we have to do this all by ourselves and we don't the third thing is to try to establish eye contact with the person. Now, you can't look at a person constantly. Uh, that's, that's not good. I mean, if you try to constantly look at them in the eyes, that's, that's a little bit too much. It's overwhelming for many people, particularly if they're an introvert. But we can try to do it in such a way that we, we look ever periodically. We might look at their nose. We might look at their mouth. We might look at, you know, past them in, in the direction for a minute. But that we have, that they know that we're, we're there for them, we're present. I'm here for you. Another thing in, in doing it is we can lean towards the person. Now, 
in different cultures that can be a little tricky. If you're from a Southern European culture or South American culture, people do speak to one another in a lot of different ways than what some people from the Northern European crowd of people would do. For instance, the Northern European crowd would be like, Hi, how are you? The Southern European and Spanish uh, and Hispanic would be, Hi, how are you? <laughs> like Bert Gezi. <laughs> and you're like, Whoa! You know, if you're from a, a family or a culture that's different. So you kind of find out a little bit about the person to be not be offensive in terms of it. In, in Far Eastern cultures, they move away and speak and bow to one another. So that's even more... Uh, but that's just knowing some of the, the cultural things between people. Open posture is what they always talk about, is mirroring the body language of the other person. If the person is going like this, you can go like this. If the person is going, but if you want to help them to open up and you want to be open, you just open up. You don't put that like that. Although I learned from my wife, who's an introvert, that very often an introvert, when you're trying to, to talk with them about something or they're listening to something, They'll put their arms like this and, and go back like they're trying to think about this first before they respond. And that's very important that we realize the difference between introverts and extroverts in terms of communication. All the time we're trying to speak with someone or listen to somebody, we're trying to listen to what God is saying. What is God moving you to express by way of care and concern for the other person? And if we, if we know that they're a person who might be a little bit, we don't know them that well, or we're, they're from another culture, we might ask, do you mind if I move closer to you and talk? Can we, you know, or, you know, is it okay, you know, if I if I move and, and just touch your, your hand for a moment? Because I really feel the pain that's coming from you. We're trying to always mirror the Father's love, the unconditional, no strings attached love. The second major communication skill is identification. And that means to discover our relatedness to someone else. It calls for self-disclosure. We can talk a little bit about our family, our occupation, ask them where they're from, what they do for fun. I, I, I've often disarmed even uh, priests and bishops where I would be in a group and I'd be talking with them. And, and I'd look at the bishop and I'd say, well, bishop, what do you do for fun? And the bishop would go, what? What do I do for fun? Like he never had fun in his whole life. And, and I just said, well, you know, that really was a, I told him what I did for fun. And then he, he started to warm up to it. And he says, well, I like to walk on the beach. And one bishop I, I used to know said he even takes off his pectoral cross, wears a t-shirt, and takes off his bishop's ring and walks on the beach. And so you just introduce him as Mr. So-and-so instead of introducing himself as Bishop So-and-so. Because he felt it intimidated people and they wouldn't really speak too, too freely to him. How do we do this? How do we move on to becoming more available to a person and identifying with them? We want to understand where the person is coming from. I really have failed at this so many times. The first major time I did was I, what, I had met Jesus Christ as a person. I wanted to give my life. I wanted to reach out to others and share my faith with them. And my mom said to me, you know, you had to do something. You, you, could, you want to talk about this? And my family was really kind of turned off by me talking about Jesus to them. He said, well, you know, your cousin Jim, he's, he's a drug addict. He's downtown somewhere. Why don't you go talk to him about Jesus? And they figured, oh, God, thank you. We got him out of the house. He won't be talking to us for a while. So I went down. I found out I worked in a neighborhood center, and I was able to find out where Jim was. I knocked on the door, and there was people in the halls and everything all kind of looked a little strange um and they probably thought what is this strange guy doing knocked on the door and, and he said and jim came to the door and i said jim can i come in and talk with you i want to tell you about how jesus has changed my life and jim looked at me and kind of like we hadn't seen each other in a few years it's just the first thing this person ever comes up with is what he wants to do but he said come on in so we sat down i sat across the table from him and I said, Jim, I just got to tell you, Jesus has totally changed my life. God is so real and so wonderful. And he's done so many things in my life. And he's healing me. And he's taking care of me. And I'm going on and on and on. And he says to me, 
John, I can't hear you. And I'm saying to myself, what? Has the drugs cost him to lose his hearing? He can't hear anymore? And I said to him, what do you mean you can't hear me? He said, I can't hear you. When we were kids, my brothers used to come and stay at your house and visit you and play in the yard. And never once did you invite me to come. Not once. And I've hated you ever since I was a kid. And I was like, oh my God. And a little thing went off inside of me. Not much evangelization is going to take place here today. And I thought for a minute and I said, oh God, it seemed like an eternity. I had, what was, what was the response to this? And I said, you know, Jim, I was, I was older than you. I was older than you by about eight years. And I'm really sorry that I made you feel that way. Please forgive me. And he stood up and he said, get out of here. I don't want to talk to you anymore. And so I did. I felt like a complete failure. Now, what I did do, I think, was try to listen to what the Lord was saying at the same time and ask him for insight or wisdom to respond to what Jim was saying. And that, I believe, was really from God that he, asked, that he told me to just ask him to forgive you. Active listening looks for clues about how to slant our response to meet a person where they really are. And it can take some time to practice and do that. Pope Francis says, listening always requires the virtue of patience together with the ability to allow oneself to be surprised by the truth. I was very surprised by the truth of my relationship with Jim. Even if only a fragment of the truth in the person that we're listening to. Listen with this frame of mind is listening with this frame of mind is always enriching because there is always something, however small, that I can learn from the other person and allow it to bear fruit in my own life. I learned that day that I needed to check in with people and find out how I came across to them before I tried to do any kind of faith sharing. And I need to give a periodic summary of what the person is saying in these word in their words. Now I didn't do a great job of that with Jim, but he was saying I was really hurt by you. And express how they seem to feel about it. People give off core messages, areas of need, stress, or transition where the Holy Spirit might be making some divine appointment for them down the road. And maybe with now, even now. The third major communication skill is empathy. To be with the person in their hurt and struggles and needs and stresses and transitions as best we can. A couple of years after that experience with Jim, his mom died. I went to, uh, we actually went to her, her deathbed in the hospital and we prayed with her. They weren't, he wasn't there and nobody else from the family was there at the time. And we went to the wake in the funeral. And up at the wake, I went up to try to shake his hand and offer him condolences. And he turned his back on me and walked away. Wouldn't at all communicate. But I was there. That's all I could do. Be present. Empathy also says about we try to help the person know that you believe that they're struggling. We communicate how much God loves them and try to experience Jesus' care for them that he is with them too in this situation. What I didn't know at that time is that there are many languages of love that we need to understand about how people experience love from us. And unless they experience love in a way that they prefer to be loved, at least at the beginning, we're not going to have much impact in their lives in, in expressing love to them. How do we become fluent in the ways people need to be loved? In the writings of Dr. Gary Chapman, there's a book called The Five Languages of Love, A Secret to Love That Lasts. He discovered that there are five basic ways that people experience love. And some people, this is their preferred way. 
And if we're really going to be able to express Christ's love to them, we have to at least find out the best their language that's most comfortable with them. Words of affirmation and encouragement is one of those ways of expressing love. Doing acts of service for them is, a, is a, an act of love. Receiving a gift from another and giving a gift to another is an act of love. Totally different in many ways from one another. Spending quality time with another person. If we don't spend quality time with people that we, we love, that that's their need, they run around empty with nothing in their lives. They don't feel loved by us. Sometimes they won't tell us what they need to be loved, but we got to work at that to figure out which is the best way. And finally, physical touch. Now, physical touch, especially in close relationships, but there are, there are people that if we, you know, we hear a really sad story or something that's going on in their life, and we feel moved to to put our our hand on their hands or our hand on their shoulder and to just you know tell them we're we're so blessed that you're you're here with us today, and that you didn't you know commit suicide or or go off a car in a car and crash it because you you were so dis despairing at a particular time in your life. So there's words of affirmation, acts of service, receiving gifts, spending quality time, physical touch. Relationships with another person break down when we try to love them in ways they do not prefer, at least initially. We naturally tend to project onto other the primary ways we ourselves need to be loved. That may not be true. We need to stop, look, and listen. Pay attention. The find out of paying attention to others in learning how they need to experience God's love in a concrete way. How willing are we to launch out and make mistakes, to repent, to ask forgiveness, and to start over again loving others again? As it says in 1 John 4, Beloved, let us love one another because love is of God, and everyone who loves is begotten of God and knows God. Ten years after I had gone to try to speak to my cousin Jim, on Christmas Day, I got a phone call from Jim. I had no idea what it was. I'm sitting here Christmas Day. I figured out, hi, this is Jim. I'm saying to myself, oh, oh my God. Somebody must have died in the family. That's what I figured. And I said, hi, Jim. And he said, well, he says, I called you. He said, I cannot express the joy that I have in my heart. Because I wanted to tell you first that I have given my life to Jesus Christ, I'm part of a church community, and I'm going through deeper and deeper healing of all the stuff that happened in my life that caused me to be addicted to drugs. And he said at the end of the conversation, I said, well, Jim, I, I'm really appreciative of this, but why would you call me first? He said, well, things started to change the day that you asked me to forgive you. You never know what's going to change as we're listening to trying to listen to God. You never know what it is that's going to touch another person's life and will bring about conversion, a change of heart. Put on then, it says in Colossians, put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, heartfelt compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving one another if one has a grievance against another. As the Lord has forgiven you, so also you should do. And over all these things put on love, that is the bond of perfection. Now, as many people have asked, I started this talk about talking about how I experienced hurt at being called a bastard from being conceived out of wedlock. What happened was, after I spoke with Sister Mary Roberts, um, I had an opportunity to go to counseling, professional counseling, about how I felt about my parents, how I felt about myself. And I was married to Teresa at the time, and I would go to counseling, and then we, I would come home, and she would pray with me for healing about whatever the, the painful memories and things that were going on at, during the counseling session. And one time when we were praying, she just invited me to remember the room in which we were playing cards. In my imagination, I saw Jesus, and to see Jesus come into the room, 
put his hands on my shoulder or do whatever he needed to do to help me be healed of that painful, painful experience that I experienced the day I was playing cards. Well, here's what happened in my imagination. Jesus walked into the room. Joe and I were sitting there playing cards. He walked over. He put one of his hands on my shoulder. And he said to me, some people are bastards by an accident of birth. And he put his hand on Joe's shoulder and he said, and some people choose to be bastards. I laughed and laughed and laughed. And Teresa didn't know what was going on. This was all happening inside of me. I laughed and laughed. And finally, I told her what it was. She started roaring about the whole thing. I was healed. Teresa is going to speak about uh, transformation in Christ. For us to be able to be these kinds of living mirrors to one another that express really unconditional love, we need to be surrendering to transformation in Jesus, what Jesus wants to do with us, what he is doing with us. So many uh, stories of what God has done in my life and in our marriage. And I actually keep a list of some of the important times when God has intervened in my life. And I recommend it because we often forget, we get amnesia um, in terms of what kinds of things God has done. And if you kind of, even just a little five word summary of it, then you have in the back of your mind the kind of stories that might be appropriate when you've listened to someone. So that's just an aside. God is always, always, always interested in drawing us closer. Uh, I like to compare it to when a grandparent meets their grandchild for the first time. It's just a physical thing that you want to hold them to yourself for, and for quite some time. So uh, God is always wanting to hold us and to make us uh, more like him and more aware of God's love. There's a story that I heard a long time ago that a fellow, a fellow who lived in a trailer was given a puppy as a gift. And, and this was one of those one room trailers, not the five or six room kind. And the puppy was a little large, but really cute. And uh, learned quickly how to obey the kind of things that built the relationship. But he, he kept being kind of fast. And so this fellow brought the puppy to the vet and he said, I'm not sure what's going on. I thought the puppy would stay the size uh, for his whole life. And the veterinarian laughed and said, oh no, this is a St. Bernard. Meet God. It, it is kind of a warm, fuzzy thing uh, for some people, not everybody. And we find out we have a choice to make. Do I keep the puppy and find a new house? Or mm. I get rid of the puppy so my life won't be turned upside down? And in a way, that's what happens when we meet Jesus. It's a kind of a tiny thing at first. And when you think of baptism, you're an infant. When you're given the whole life of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So you don't know nothing except about the way your parents treat you. But as time goes along, we find out more and more of God's love if it's nurtured. When I received my first communion, I was not a happy person. My mother was about eight months pregnant with baby number four. I was baby number one. And she was a little cranky. <clears throat> we were going to receive our first communion on June 5th instead of during the month of May like everybody else. And my mother's first thought was, oh good, she can wear her cousin's dress. 
uh, which did not make me very happy. And it was raining. So all these things were going on in my little mind until I went up to communion and there was a song about Jesus being the bridegroom of my heart and everything changed. So God intervenes and scripture has several images for growth or transformation. One is the vine and the branches, each of us being a tiny leaf on this great big vine. The other is the grain of wheat and we need to be willing to be planted where God has put us and alongside a whole lot of other grains of wheat that are in that place so that when God touches us, say the wind goes through a field, God can touch us all at once. We aren't just talking about the transformation of an individual, we're talking about the transformation of a community. Uh, the other important image is the human body, that we're all parts of each other. If the eye should say, I don't need a foot, or if the arm should say, I, I don't need uh, the shoulder, I can work all by myself, which isn't true. But in the body of Christ, I like to use this image right here. This is something that is used by medical professionals in treating children in third world countries that are malnourished. This goes inside here. And if the little person's arm is this wide, then they're malnourished. If the little person's arm goes in the yellow, then there's danger of being malnourished. And green is a normal, healthy person. And I think if we were to measure the kinds of things that are going on in the church right now, if we're generous, we would say we're yellow <laughs> in terms of the danger of recovering from not being able to receive the sacraments in person in the church building. And that's part of our call to evangelize is to recognize person by person what we can do. And also, if we happen to be in, in charge of programming, what we can do to make that Christ-centered so that we are giving people the possibility of growing, of feeling like they've been healed and listened to. When I was 40, I uh, discovered that I was pregnant. And I called my aunt because she was a very good listener in the family. And I just went on and on. And she said, of course, you remember that I was pregnant at 40 with my first child. And I said, yes. And she said, Teresa, you have a decision to make. Is this good news or bad news? And I have already decided this is very good news. So transformation can be encouraged by another person, but mostly it's an inside job because we believe that Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are within us and bringing us ever more closely and calling us to holiness. That's another name for transformation as far as I'm concerned, is the call to holiness. That aching to be one with God and to be one with people in the church and to act as if you were Jesus standing in front of one person. I like to, when I'm talking with someone, start off by listening by saying, Jesus, please light up my face so that this person knows that I care about them. Now we can get into the way Jesus was transformed and the 
decision that we each need to make to imitate Jesus. <clears throat> Excuse me. In John 15, we hear, remain in me as I remain in you. Just as a branch cannot bear fruit on its own unless it remains on the vine, so neither can you unless you remain in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. Whoever remains in me and I in him or her will bear much fruit because without me you can do nothing. Which is a very humbling uh, conclusion. Without me you can do nothing. And John likes to use the image of a waltz uh, for the Christian life as times when we feel like we're dying. It might be a pandemic. It might be uh, not having the kinds of things that we wanted to have. For instance, if a car breaks down along the road, that, that's a certain death for sure. <laughs> and there's times when we rise up from that death like Jesus did that could be um, any number of things as well but some encouragement comes our way or we hear God's voice in prayer or the scriptures I like to read the scriptures of the day and one of the ones that I remember most often is from I think Isaiah John it's something about wishing for the person's happiness and that the plans of God are not to put us down anyway and the third one is kind of like a honeymoon thing <coughs> that happens and the most easily understood example is when you go on a retreat and everything seems right in the world and this is wonderful and uh, I'll pray every day for the rest of my life and all those kinds of things. So we imitate that die, rise, and reign that Jesus went through. Now I'll take a little look at each of those separately. Sometimes the dying happens because of external forces. This is an egg in a vice. And I'm sure some of us have felt that way from time to time. Sometimes it's within us where we're disappointed. I know I was very disappointed for months on end that I couldn't see my children and grandchildren. One of my experiences of rising in, in the presence of God was John mentioned in Antioch weekend and I also went on that kind of a retreat as well. But it's only by God's intervention. I opened my mailbox at the college, saw this paper about a co-ed retreat, and you know I'm saying, but I don't think so. So I threw it in the trash. The girl next to me opened her mailbox, saw the same thing. She started jumping up and down and finally invited me. I am so thrilled. This will be wonderful. This will be one of the best moments of my life. And I looked at her and I looked at the trash bucket and I went and fished that out of the trash. And that's how God kind of led me to a breakthrough in my life. It was a revelation from God and through this other person. It really wasn't even trying to relate to me. I think reigning with Jesus means finding ways to pay attention to the presence of God all day long. And there's lots of ways to do this. You might take a line from scripture like we did when we first started. Put it on a little piece of paper on the refrigerator or on your desk and repeat it again and again throughout the day. I think that Jesus, you know, could, at when he rose from the dead, could have just gone to heaven and that was that. But that's not how it worked. He had a sense of uh, friendship and compassion 
and just wanted to share himself with his friends. So you have accounts of him uh, coming on the, so the shore after you know, Peter and the rest had gone fishing. You have accounts of him seeing Mary Magdalene first. You have a very interesting line at the end of, I believe it's the Acts of the Apostles, but that says, we have only talked about a few, a few of the times that Jesus has appeared. There are many, many more that we don't have the capacity to tell you about right now. And I think we are a part of that many, many more ways that Jesus has appeared. The challenge, I think, for some of us is we get stuck on one of those, and most often it's stuck on the dying one. You know, poor me, God's, God, I've been asking God for help with this for two weeks and nothing has happened. Some people call it uh, desolation in, in the classical spiritual writers. But I think physically at that point in time, it's good to just reach out your arms and say, Jesus, pick me up in whatever way you want. That rise can mean uh, getting up or standing up to pray instead of sitting there and feeling sorry for yourself. It can mean a consolation that comes just by going outside and seeing the beauty of spring, for instance. And then there's the other kind of temptation is that when we experience that reigning with Jesus, that honeymoon kind of life with God, oh, this should be this way all the time. And that's not the way the life of Jesus unfolded. So why should it be the way that we experience? We need to follow Jesus, imitate that die, rise, and reign. Another experience of, of, of dying that really was incredible to me is I was about five months pregnant when my mother died. It was difficult to cope with that and be pregnant at the same time. We had found out that she had died at oh, 11 o'clock at night or something like that. And it was announced at a prayer meeting that we normally would be going to. So 10 minutes after that, there was a knock at the door, 11 p.m. My friend Connie was there. She said, I'd like to take your children all day tomorrow because we had a two and a half year old and a one and a half year old. And I said, Connie, you can't. I just found out yesterday that one of them has lice. And she said, I, I don't care what they have. I can buy shampoo. I can use towels. We'll stay outside in the yard. It will be wonderful for them. And it's embarrassing to share that, but we lived in the inner city and, you know, God is everywhere. He, he's in the middle of all those cities in the Ukraine. He's in the school buildings with those frightened children, traumatized children. He's with us. There's nothing, as in uh, Romans 8, there's nothing that can keep us from the love of God. And just so we understand it, there's a whole list of things that we would think might keep us from the love of God. The other thing about transformation is to be aware of how God does this kind of thing in our faith communities and in our parishes. In the document on the laity by Pope St. John Paul II, he brings up three ways that God works in our communities. And I shifted them around a little bit. One is creating communion among us. And 
giving us that joy of seeing each other, being with each other. I don't know about you, but at Mass on a Sunday, there's this couple that usually sat right behind us. And they haven't been there since the pandemic ended. So I am concerned about them and I miss them. And that's a good thing. Community is an imitation, a, a mirror of the Trinity. God is community personified, Father, Son, and Spirit, three persons in one God. And we're meant to be drawn up into that kind of community. And that's the roots of the community. It's the roots of the term Pilgrim Church. We are headed not just like cars on a highway all going someplace different. But in the church, we're called, even though we fail, we're called to be headed in the same direction. Because a pilgrimage is about going to a certain holy place together. And that's what we're meant to be as a community. We're all going towards heaven. It doesn't mean we don't look by the side of the road and see people that gave up. But we in confidence know that God might want us to help them carry them along on the journey. I brought a, a group of young people on a retreat once in Quebec. And we arrived late. It was about six of us. I found the places where all the others were staying and I realized, wait a minute, I'm staying someplace different than everybody else. And that was kind of worrisome because I couldn't understand the language. And there were people hanging around outside of this building that looked like uh, vagrants or something. I don't, I don't know if that's true or not, but I was plenty scared. So I went up to my room and I pushed the bed against the door to protect myself. And I couldn't do anything about this transom above the door, like this thing that comes down uh, like a window. And I didn't sleep really soundly. But in the morning, what I woke up to was a whole lot of people in the hallway singing religious hymns. So the whole time, I was protecting myself from the body of Christ, which I pray that I don't do anymore, although I fall into it easily. And then there's a passage about the unity of uh, being created through the gifts of the Spirit, as in 1 Corinthians 12. There are different kinds of gifts with the same spirit. Each one manifests the spirit in a given way for the common good. No one is given the spirit just for themselves. One might have a message of wisdom, another knowledge, another healing. We are just one body, though many parts. And it's when we discover each other's needs and gifts. We talked about listening to each other's needs, but we also need to pay attention to each other's gifts so that we can see the spirit working in the body of the church. We did a series like this in a church on Long Island and there was a core of people who really grew in God's grace and holiness, and it was wonderful to behold. But about a month later, and this tells you how old we are, there was the crash of a TWA flight into the water right off of Long Island, and it crashed within about a mile or two of this parish. So the whole parish was involved in reaching out to relatives, members of the press. They took turns being in the parking lot, 
they supported people with money and uh, housing. If someone wanted to know what happened to their daughter or son, well, why don't you stay with me for a few days until they figure it out? And you won't be driving on the highway all upset. And it came uh, about a month past that was Ash Wednesday. And they deliberately designed the Ash Wednesday service as a way to reach out to and publicly proclaim Jesus, which of course Father and McDonald was doing every way, almost every day when they interviewed him. But the most important thing they decided they wanted to do was let a couple whose daughter was killed in the crash give their witness during Ash Wednesday. And it was a source of great consolation and a challenge as well. So this couple was able to speak, but I, like I say, people brought sandwiches, they let people in their house, all kinds of things. Do you remember what Father McDonald used to say when he'd be interviewed? He kept on holding up the cross oh. and saying, there's no, there's no way to express the, the terrible thing that's happened. It's an experience of, and he held up the cross, in the, every single interview, every time he preached. The third one is mission. And that's what we've concentrated most of our time on during this uh, session. That God calls us to use the gifts that we have together and, and personally as well. We had a, a priest who was a friend of ours, lived in D.C., came home to clean out his parents' house when they died. And he contracted some kind of a mold infection and then quickly pneumonia. He was really not conscious or at least at best semi-conscious every once in a while. And he was on uh, three or four different antibiotics at the same time. They weren't sure if he was going to make it and I know that I have a gift of intercessory prayer. So I pray for him, but I say, no, this doesn't feel right. So once a week, I went up to the hospital. I said hello to him in case he could hear me. And then I chat. I sat in a uh, chair and prayed for him in the same room. And I think that was an important thing to do, get as close as I could. I think one of the things we can do as we even consider this is to embrace this constant waltz of the spirit, dying, rising, reigning, dying, rising, reigning, as a good thing, as the way that we actually are transformed. I like to try to do that when I hear the word read at Mass on Sunday or any other Mass is when the priest goes or the deacon goes and crosses themselves, may the word of God be in my mind and on my mouth and in my heart. And I'm gonna invite you to do that right now. May the word of God be in my mind and in my mouth and in my heart. That we constantly are being transformed by Jesus, the word of God written and spoken. 